Hey everyone, Ruta Jung is back again, and he's going to be talking about Gaussian processes and subspaces. Um, this is a presentation, so for people who are listening in on podcasting platforms, you might want to switch to the video version on YouTube for this, and I'll include a link in the description. Um, so, Ruta, welcome back. I really enjoyed our last conversation. Um, I've thought about it quite a bit since then, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation today. So, let's hop over and hear, hear your cool stuff. All right, thanks. Today, I'm just gonna give a short, um, easy presentation to the work. Um, so this work is about using Gaussian process to predict uh, subspaces um, and specific applications is to how to reduce models uh, of dynamical systems. So this work is done by me and also my two co-authors, Sam and Mac and David Dunson. Um, all of us are at Duke. So let me start with what question we're actually asking. So consider we have a simulator that is run on computers. There can be all kinds of um, problems that can be simulated. Uh, usually those are dynamical systems and so, so for computer models, there is a term called parametric studies. So what this means is that your simulator has some input parameters that controls the model, and you can change that to affect the behavior of the problem. And usually you want to um, provide many um, combinations of those parameters just to see the overall effect. Uh, so this is useful for several types of tasks, including design, optimization, um, and also you can do control uh, in real time. And you can also do problems from uh, including uncertainty quantification and also parameter estimation. So let me give you one example. So here you see is a um, what we call animometer, or it is a MEMS device that measures the flow speed of its surroundings. So if you see at this at the, at the picture, the, it, the picture shows the temperature profile um, and there is flow from the left to the right. What this does is that it, uh, the, the sensors measures the temperature um, and using the correlation between the temperature measurement and the flow speed, we can measure, uh, we can measure the, the flow. And, for this to work, you need to calibrate how this mapping is. So you need to uh, measure the flow speed and temperature at different types of flow scenarios. So for this device to be accurate, you need to calibrate it. Um, how to do it? Um, so we start with a simulator that uh, discretizes the underlying physics, which is governed by a convection diffusion um, partial differential equations that becomes a linear ordinary differential equations of high order. So here for this specific model, the dimension is about 30,000. Um, so for this case, we, so we need to run this large ODE system for multiple types of uh, inflow speed for the calibration target. Another problem is he shown as a micro rocket here you see um, on the left, it's actually just one unit that, uh, that can be combined into an array. So the goal is to file each of these units independently without thermal inference. Um, so here we need to design the uh, like circuit and the geometry of this uh, micro rocket. Um, and, for, and the underlying physics is the heat transfer. We discretize it. And it also gives a linear ODE. Uh, so, so these are just two examples of what we, uh, we can look at as simulation problems. Yeah. So um, for the, this uh, first image, just to make sure that I understand it properly, um, is each of these pixels a different simulation? Or is the entire image a um, essentially an emission from a single set of parameterizations. And then as you vary the parameterizations, you get multiple, uh, essentially multiple images. So for example, like the uh, flow profile is uh, the result of a single parameterization. Is that correct? 
Um, let me explain this. So, so this is, you can consider this as the um, uh, X axis and the horizontal dimension, and this is the vertical dimension. So this is basically a, um, a, a vertical uh, section of the flow. So, um, so, so basically you put this sensor at the bottom of the flow. And so the flow profile means that flow speed at different locations in this, you can consider the height. So the picture of the colors shows the different temperatures. So the uh, red, yellow area is high temperature and the blue area is low temperature. So what you're seeing is uh, uh, the, the real time temperature field uh, at one specific time point. Cool, that's very helpful, thank you. All right. So these are some of the simulation problems that fall into this category. Um, we want to reduce, uh, we want to make the simulation faster because usually if you want to run multiple parameters, the simulation time can be really, really slow. So the goal is to make them fast. So let me first give you one example of how this is possible. First, let's consider the vibration of structure. Here we are showing the pole of a wind turbine. Um, the underlying physics can be described by the, uh, the equation above. Here you see um, the x and x dots are co which corresponds to the displacement, velocity, and acceleration. And their matrices uh, corresponding to the mass, damping, and stiffness. And what makes the system move is an external driving force that changes over time. So this is an ordinary differential equation system, usually of a high order. So to analyze this, um, we, uh, we can use a technique called modal analysis. Specifically, we can use this so-called vibration eigen mode. So consider an arbitrary vibration on the left, we can decompose it's into several eigenmodes on the right. So the eigenmodes are, um, so the first eigenmodes uh, is a simple vibration and the shape does not change. What changes in time is only the amplitude of it. So, so instead of uh, a shape that is arbitrarily changes in time, you can have a fixed shape with constant um, scaling that, that is a time series. And using this decomposition, um, it is, I mean, so first of all, the eigenmodes in a complete set, you can describe an arbitrary vibration. But the good thing is that you oftentimes only need a small set of these eigenmodes to describe uh, the actual vibra vibration to a uh, rather high accuracy. So what we do is to take the top eigenmodes and do a truncation to for an approximation. So notice that for each of these eigenmodes, the Vs here, they form a, um, you can consider them as a basis of a subspace. So you combine V1, V2, and V3 and do a span, then you get a subspace of a much lower dimension than the original uh, space of the um, displacement. So, Instead of studying directly this high dimensional uh, ODE system, you can, pro uh, you can reduce the dynamical system by constraining the movement to this low dimensional subspace. Now, in this case, instead of running a high order system, you're running a small dimensional system, which can be much faster. So with this, we can achieve the goal of um, dimensional reduction. So are these uh, these uh, spans of the subspace, are these derived physically from the physical properties like you identify them a priori from the physics or is your goal to actually just learn them from the data themselves? That's a great question. So for here, the eigenmodes are actually derived directly from the, the two matrices M and K. So they are just the generalized eigenvectors of M and K. Um, so you can, so in this sense, it is derived from the physics, but there are other ways to do modal analysis, not just eigenmodes, that you can directly use data, either from simulation or experiments for this purpose. So it can be both ways, depending on the, depending on the method you are using. Cool, thanks. So this is just one example of how we can reduce the size of a dynamical system 
And in general, um, it goes like this. So we start with a physics model that are governed by these equations. We provide an input here stated as u. And the input affects the um, state of the ODE system through the first equation. And the usually this x is a very high dimensional. And oftentimes we don't really directly care about what x is, but rather through a low dimensional um, linear combinations of it. So this y is what we call output. Now, given every input, we can get an output. But the simulation of this, uh, this original model is really um, slow because it scales with uh, super linearly with the dimension of x. And this x is usually really large in hundreds of thousands. So the simulation time can be quite slow for large systems. So the concept of a reduced order model or ROM is that we keep the exact form of the input and the output, but rather use a much smaller system. So if we keep dimension on the order of 10, consider the scaling, we can achieve orders of magnitudes uh, acceleration. But how do we do this? Recall that in the previous slide, we have these eigenmodes, right? So each of those V forms a basis of a subspace. So here we represent the original space, Euclidean space as a sphere and colored in orange is the low dimensional subspace. So the, these vectors are bases which spans to this low dimensional subspace. There are many methods that you can derive this reduced basis, not only eigenmodes, and there are many, but there are also many other modes. Once you have them, you can construct the reduced system using these equations. But the problem is the computation for these uh, reduced bases is rather slow. Um, but as long as you have it, you can repeat the the computation for any kind of input, and it will give you approximate, uh, approximately accurate um, output in a real uh, small amount of time. Well, this is a general idea when the system um, is fixed. Consider here we have a dependency on some parameters, as, the, as is the case for parametric studies. Then, but initially, you need to compute this uh, reduced basis for every possible value of the theta. And this will make the overall computation really, really slow because you, what you want to do is to speed up this simulation. But once you need to repeat this computation step uh, many times, you are not really getting much out of it. So one possibility is to do an emulation directly Instead of going through this, you would use an emulator that approximates the mapping from the parameters to the reduced basis. So here we see that we are this overall framework combines an emulator and a reduced model to get a reduced model that also changes with the parameters. So this is the overall goal. Um, so now, if you consider the reduced model, which directly uses the physics, uh, and the emulator, which only uses the data, you're combining a data-driven method with a physics-based method. And this is a very unique combination that is quite popular in, in recent research. So just to uh, for people who aren't as familiar or up to speed on uh, reduced order modeling, someone like myself. Um, if we go all the way back to the beginning of the slide, um, so the initial problem is that, of course, we have this, uh, we have this uh, complex uh, high dimensional physics. And then we go to the next uh, image, which is the uh, reduced order model. So this is the goal. And your innovations, essentially sort of the different modeling strategies that we have comes around what pops up in the center. Um, or how, how do we actually reduce this? So the uh, center image. Yep. And um, so this is this is one of multiple proposals that we can get go used to go from the physics to the reduced order model. And one of the challenges is, I guess, and correct me if I'm wrong, that effectively 
you're actually changing the parameterizations of the physics because uh, presumably, like, for example, it might be uncertainty of uncertain of it, or the actual physics and the simulations of interest might change. So effectively, it isn't just trying to say we need to do get derive this reduced order model once. It's saying now it's basically this cross the number of parameterizations. And as I've decided before, or you know, as you said, this is a huge number. So effectively, it's a huge number cross expense cross the actual, you know, um, uh, finding, finding the projection, finding the subspaces. And what your innovation is, if we go to the next slide, uh, and just to be clear, we can do many things in order to get from physics to ROM. Um, but what your, what your solution is, is effectively um, wrapping in a, um, in a principled way, the physics and the uh, subspace, um, the projection onto the subspaces into a single emulation. So effectively, this is all being done in a cohesive uh, inference, if you will. So it's like, a, it's a, this is now a single cohesive piece, as opposed to saying we're going to do like a bunch of them piecemeal. Is that, um, is, is that a sort of a good high level summary of what the strategy is? Yeah, that's a very good summary. So, so I just want to add, so for the parameters, the reason why we change it in parametric studies is indeed one, in case you don't actually know the value of the parameters. So say there is some uncertainty to it. So this is the case for stochastic uh, simulations. And another case is, for example, you consider design or, or optimization. So for example, if you are designing um, a building or an, the shape of an aircraft wing, then these parameters can describe the shape of it. Then you potentially want to search an optimal combination of those parameters, which represents an optimal shape. Uh, for that, you need to um, search the whole parameter space for these optimizations. So, so that's another case where we want to evaluate the model as different type, different values of the parameters. So this is our just two general use cases. Yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah. All right. So this is the is this a proposed framework um, that can um, f solve this problem of speeding up parametric studies. And so there has been methods previously proposed, for example, in this paper. So let's consider what we have to start with. So the data is a collection of the parameters, so which is usually a sample of the parameter space. Um, and each of them is a small dimensional vector. And for each parameter, you compute a reduced basis represented by a matrix. Now, given all these data, what you want to do is to, for example, do an interpolation type of uh, approximation. But the challenge is for each of these responses, there are subspaces. So if you consider each subspace as one point, um, then the overall set is a manifold, which is not linear. So the specific term is called a Grassmann manifold, but without that, you just consider this manifold is not linear. So it is in contrast with, for example, vector spaces, you cannot do linear combinations. So the difficulty is that without the linear combination, you cannot do interpolation. So that makes it difficult. So what that paper um, proposed is a procedure like this. You can pick one data point as your reference point. And for this manifold, you can, there are tangent spaces at every point. So take this reference point, um, there is a tangent space looking like this. You can map every other point back to this tangent space. And now you can do linear, you can do interpolation um, using any method. So suppose you have this interpolated method on the tangent space, you can map it back to the manifold, and that is your prediction. So this three-step procedure is rather general, and they were able to show that you can, you can achieve um, one or a few times of speed up than the direct computation of the reduced models. But over time, people have realized that it, there are several downsides of this method. First, it is not flexible in that up to now, there has been difficulty finding the optimal um, model specification in that 
which uh, interpolation method to use and how exactly um, implement this method. So there is no, in other words, there's no um, automatic way to select, to do model selection. And also it is extrinsic in that you are turning this manifold to a, another problem on the tangent space, which is external to the original problem. So you can cause several um, errors by in this, in this um, process. And also traditional interpolation methods does not provide uncertainty quantification. So this procedure does not provide UQ as well. So what our method is going to do is exactly try to um, solve these difficulties. Now, our, our method called GPS but builds upon traditional Gaussian processes. So here, let us um, just um, review some basics of it. Now, traditional Gaussian process goes like this. You start with an unknown black box function that maps from parameters to a usually real valued response. The Gaussian process takes two inputs. One is a prior process uh, specified uh, by the mean function and a, uh, a covariance kernel. So usually we, this, in this step, we introduce some hyperparameters. And the second element we need for a Gaussian process is likelihood, uh, which basically specifies conditional on the true function value, the likelihood of, of observing on different values in your data. This is often specified as a Gaussian distribution, and usually it is non-singular. Um, combine, once you have these two elements, you can derive a posterior using the, the Bayesian formula, and you can make predictions um, in two types. So if your data is actually no noise, which is often the case for deterministic simulations, um, you can directly use the conditional uh, distribution um, a general um, uh, out, um, type of uh, um, result shows is shown on the left. So what you have is at your data points, the predictions are exactly what is in your data. But within your data points uh, and beyond your data points, the predictions are probabilistic. Um, in case your data is noisy, which is um, usually the case in your um, in typical statistical problems, then you use the, um, you make predictions which combines the conditional distribution and the posterior. So on the right is one example of this. So in both problems, we are, uh, the true function is a sine, a sinusoidal curve, and the mean prediction is highlighted in black. Now, this is just the very basic uh, uses of Gaussian processes, but we cannot directly use this for our purpose. Now, I will- we, Yeah, maybe yeah. before we move on, just for people who aren't, you know, who don't have uh, Rasmussen and Williams uh, right, right on their bed stand. Um, so like, you know, I, I think a lot of people are familiar with the Gaussian process. They see this uh, sausage link pattern, like on uh, what's on the left. Yeah. And the key there, you know, as you said, is that um, this is a noiseless, uh, this, is, this is a noiseless system or effectively, once you've observed a single point there, you know exactly what that value will be. You know, it's it's unchanging, but you have uncertainty where you haven't observed. And so essentially uh, these gray areas are like draws, you know, possible Gaussian processes. You can think of basically possible uh, multi-dimensional uh, Gaussians um, drawn such that these values are fixed. So they can continue to vary um, with varying levels of, uh, we'll just say probability to keep the terminology simple. And so that, that's where effectively we'll have these gray, um, these different gray lines that can go through, but they're required to go through these points no matter what, um, because th those are essentially like the truth, like as in like truth of the capital T, the physics the, the cannot, have a system other than the data that shows up these points. And when you calculate a large number of these draws, these gray lines, what we have then is that predictive interval in red, where effectively you're you're looking at like essentially the how often these gray draws 
fall within a certain range. And that's what gives rise to that, you know, that classic Gaussian process sausage link graph that everyone's familiar with. And then, you know, when reality hits, and these are very useful for like, for example, like com computational simulations where there's going to be basically no, 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 or very little noise. Um, or for like, uh, essentially certain fixed, uh, non-stochastic, um, deterministic, uh, processes. And then in contrast, uh, for people, um, for essentially systems like on the right, where the data is fundamentally noisy, which means that, uh, even if you have observed, say that at here, we have X equals two, Y equals, I don't know, 2.1, something like that. And, but we also notice right above, oh, actually you did this really well. This is a really well chosen plot because effectively we can see that, uh, using the exact same X value, you can also get an alternative one, uh, an alternative value. Oh yeah. You really chose, uh, these plots well, so, uh, well done on that. Um, and what, what we can see is that effectively there's now this fundamental level of irreducible noise and, um, yeah, I think that ex explains it well, which is why essentially we had this lumpier looking, uh, space where. It, it does not neatly break down uh, and, you know, pinch at the observation points. And uh, just for what it's worth, obviously, if you take the, these draws now can obviously be much wider because they're not required to go through these points. There's a lot wider variety. And um, now obviously you take the mean of those draws is when you get the actual um, posterior mean, um, which can still differ significantly from the truth. So anyway, I think those are really well drawn pictures and hopefully that little bit of explanation will help uh, clarify some things because this aspect I think is going to come into play next when it's when, very, very important. So anyway, I'll let you continue. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very good explanation. Um, so these are just how traditional Gaussian processes works. Um, but then there are differences in our problem. So consider this. We still take inputs um, as a low dimensional vector, but the response, as we explained earlier, these are subspaces, and which traditionally consider as a, um, for example, a, thick, a, a certain uh, low dimensional linear subspace in the Euc a high dimensional Euclidean space. If you picture each subspace as one entity, as one point of an overall possibility, the set of all um, k dimensional subspaces, this is what we call a Grassmann manifold. So this manifold is very high dimensional but it's not a vector space. So it, the, each of these elements are not a vector. So traditional Gaussian processes would not fit the bill to handle this type of problems. So what we do, the trick we use is we break it down into two functions. Um, so first take the parameter maps to the bases. So the bases are the vectors. You can consider them as a set uh, a, 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 a collection of k number of vectors in Rm, but you can also consider that as one point in a higher dimensional Euclidean space Rnk. Now, once you have this proxy function f tilde, then you take the vectors to span a subspace. So now the problem turns out, how do we emulate the, uh, the function f tilde? So as we described, we need to provide two elements. One is the prior. So what we use is to provide a scalar, a simple scalar kernel on the parameter space. Well, because here the response is actually n times k dimensional, we combine that um, with a uh, marginal distribution on the response, which is basically a, a isotropic Gaussian, which is they two are combined using a Kronek product. So this prior, looks like an isotropic Gaussian on RNK, but in the, in the set of Grassmann manifold, this prior is actually uniform. Now, the next element is the likelihood. So consider we observe a certain um, reduced species. We impose the likelihood such that all um, bases that span to the same subspace, you have the same likelihood to be observed. But any basis that does not, they have zero likelihood to be observed. So this, um, now this is a, if you consider that as a set on uh, the n times k subspace, this set is um, approximately a subspace. 
So you're imposing a value one on a, on a subspace, and that likelihood is singular um, because it's essentially zero everywhere as long as it's not in this um, low dimensional subspace. Now, with these two elements, we can move on to make the predictive distribution. So you can consider the predicted distribution on RNK as uh, another Gaussian process, uh, a Gaussian distribution, and which corresponds to a distribution on Grassmann manifold as well. So this is we are able to sh give analytical dis descriptions for both this and this predictions, and that is the nice um, property of uh, the overall GPS model. That's a really this is a really nice picture. Um, I, I think that this describes it very well, and especially if you can just sort of try to map it in your mind back to the previous uh, images that we saw. I think this is a, a really nice description. All right, so this is just a um, like illustration of how the model works overall. Next is some mathematical uh, description of what we just said. So um, I will not describe everything on this slide, but I will just point you to some highlights. So for the prior, we are using a Gaussian process, but we combine a scalar kernel with a structured distribution. Here is just a, a diagonal matrix of order n times k. We combine it with Cronach product. So what this gives is the covariance structure that can be described in this box. So recall that the response we're modeling is an n times k matrix. And the distribution uh, on this space we initially give is a isotropic Gaussian. Now, suppose you have a sample of L numbers of these matrices, then we need to provide a joint distribution for the covariance. Now, it is basically a um, matrix Cronach product with the diagonal. So figuratively, we have this kernel specified by the K function, an L by L matrix, which is dense, and combine it with the diagonal identity, identity matrix, which gives a, a large um, matrix, which is sparse banded, and usually typically looks like this. Um, so this is the covariance structure. For the likelihood, as we said, it is a, um, we are in, mathematically, it is an um, integrator function on a set. This set, um, well, you can basically think of it as a vector space in RNK. So the mathematically, it is a, takes um, zeros almost everywhere, but one at a, singular set. So combining these two gives the predictions, which um, is an actually Gaussian di distribution. And so, and so these is the form of the, the uh, uh, one component of the covariance. So the overall result of our paper is that the GPS model makes subspace predictions, which has a um, probability distribution called matrix angular central Gaussian or MACG distribution with the parameter sigma, it, which is exactly this one. The nice thing comes from the analytical form is that we can design algorithms to easily make inference and sampling. So this is the mathematical description of the model. Next, we are give some simple examples of how it is in use. Um, could I ask a little bit, uh, dumb question coming up, but basically, um, I think a lot of people when they're looking at Gaussian processes, you know, uh, they're used to looking at usually like squared exponential and, uh, essentially, um, non-scalar covariance. Could you explain why the scalar covariance, um, structure is important to the model? Just like, could you reiterate that please? Um, can you, so, so as I understand, are you saying why the kernel is important in Gaussian process? Oh, I, I think so. I, I think pretty much everyone's willing to accept like why the kernel is important, but just this choice of the uh, the scalar covariance as opposed to an alternative covariance structure. 
Yeah. Uh, okay. Picture this. So the, for example, we take the kernel. Uh, so one popular kernel in use is the square exponential. So for that, you usually have which, like, just so people know, the squared exponential basically just considered like a Gaussian. It's like a bell curve itself. Um, so as you get farther away from two points, you have this exponential decrease in covariance and correlation. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So for that, you need to specify a length scale for that kernel. So basically, how spread out the bow shape is, and if you, uh. Well, because we are, we need to specify a, a structure um, that that is basically on n times k uh, space. If you use a scalar kernel for every element of this, then you need to provide n times k scalar functions. So for each of them, you need to provide a hyperparameter that comes up uh, the number of hyperparameters will scale with n times k. Remember that the n here is pretty large and the k is small, but it, when you combine k and n's, the overall number is really, really high. So you have a huge number of hyperparameters that you want to optimize. That makes the model selection really tough. So what we do is we use only a scalar kernel. So that really limits the number of hyperparameters you need to train. And in this, we are constraining the uh, model space to improve um, so that it is well constrained and um, it is um, will be easier to uh, optimize. Excellent, cool. Yeah, so th that that's definitely helpful. So, for example, uh, just to uh, try to uh, rehash this one for people who aren't as familiar. So, if we had something like the People are more familiar with certain kernels like squared exponential, matern type kernels and things like that. But um, these have multiple hyperparameters that need to be optimized. And when we're looking at the space that you have, that becomes now essentially you're creating like a huge inference, inference problem. Um, whereas essentially for this, uh, for, for the problems in which you're working, if we can constrain this to a scalar covariance structure um, for this bit, you know, essentially we don't have this massively proliferating dimensionality problem um, to add uh, you know, on top of your solution. So uh, essentially, we're, we're just trying to not create an extra analytical problem, uh, so further intractability. Um, and does is that part of why it has this analytical form below? So did, does this help yield this analytical form? Or is that just also a nice result from it? Yeah. So. As I explained, so so the the key here is you choose a scalar um, kernel, but how you actually take turn that scalar kernel into a n times k dimensional kernel is unknown. So this structure is uh, arguably one of the simplest possible possible current combinations you can come up with. So so this structure like um, the, the uh, Carnac product with an identity matrix is highly structured. And then, well, I, I don't know whether this will give you a nice, give me a nice result when I started this research, but as I work it out, it is very nice to have, as you see in the, predict, in the predictive distribution, you also have this um, Carnac product with a um, diagonal matrix or identity matrix. So it is exactly this structure that makes the overall prediction um, um, computable, like tracked and um, possible to compute. Um, so that, so, so this is, um, I would say, happy coincidence of the, the simplifying assumption in the kernel, which turns out in the prediction. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks. It's, it's always it's always nice to uh, when you have the author, you know, the inventor, the creator, uh, to ask them these questions because you know sometimes there's a bit of intuition that they have about why they selected certain things, and other times, you know, well, there's always an intuition about it, and I always appreciate people uh, being able to explain why you know what why all these different pieces came into play. So yeah, this is really cool. Yeah. All right. So the. Uh, as I said, this is just the math. Um, to give you a better intuition of how it works, let me move on to this visualization problem. So we are trying, so think about this problem. 
how do you visualize uh, a line in a plane which changes in time? So, so consider this. So we have a line which passes, say, this is the origin of the plane. You have two ways to parameterize it. So one is to take the angle uh, in relative to a certain reference line, or you can take a circle and take the intersection of this line with the circle. So you have two antipodal points uh, that intersects. So you can take these two points as it's rep uh, to represent the line. Now, consider this. You move this circle in one direction. Now the, surf now the circle becomes the surface of a cylinder. Next, if we take one point from each of these circles and connect them, it will be a curve on this surface. So this represents, uh, if, uh, this represents a um, mapping from, for example, you take this one, pra um, one dimensional parameter to the lines. So this is a function um, for representing time varying lines. So next we take, for example, we cut this cylinder along one line and turn it flat. So then now we can nicely put it on a two dimensional plane that take and visualize it as a simple curve uh, of from X to F. So this is more conventional. So um, just to clarify that, so these point here, you only see one curve here, but back here we have two points, but because they are antipodal, you have uh, an exact symmetry of this line and another curve at the back of the cylinder. So we just take that out and take one curve that which is easier to visualize here. So this is how we visualize a time bearing lines. And next is to give an actual problem th that shows the predictive accuracy of the GPS and the alternative subspace interpolation method. So this is the result. So here on the bottom plot, you we see that we are taking, um, okay, so, so on, from this plot with the true function we're taking is a line that rotates with a constant speed. So basically the, the, the true function are a double helix on the cylinder. And on this plane plot, it corresponds to the black straight lines that goes like this. It is, I mean, well, the plot, it seems like it is discontinuous, but actually it is continuous. We're just cutting it out. So once it goes beyond this point, it re-enters from here. So it is actually very continuous and very smooth. We take seven points as data point and to make predictions using both the GPS method and the subspace interpolation method. So the blue curve is the mean prediction of the GPS method. We also provide 95% prediction intervals um, illustrated in pink shade. Now you see that the prediction accuracy is pretty good as, as in the mean and the predicted interval well covers the ground truth. In comparison, we take, um, we take two possible um, uh, implementations of the subspace interpolation and which are shown in orange. We see that the predictions can be pretty inaccurate uh, in different places of the parameter space. So this is basically show that how much improvement in accuracy the GPS method can give. Can you explain a little bit just like why, because we see those discontinuities in the subspace interpolation method. Um, what is going on with those, you know, just rapid, um, that, that wedge shape? Do, can, you, can you explain why that, uh, algorithm behaves that way? Yeah, so the discontinuity you see here is due to uh, the, 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 implement, the, the method itself. So the, the subspace in interpolation method is most accurate if you, change, if you change the reference point with your prediction point. So here we are using, so for example, if you want to predict at a point here, then you take the closest data point as the reference point. Now, if you once you cross this line, um, which uh, where you make predictions, 
then the closest reference point is here. So when you cross this boundary, you change the reference point, which makes the prediction discontinuous at this boundary. Uh, yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, cool. And just uh, just to sort of complete that, because uh, it's, it's, it's really clear what the, uh, the GPS uh, system is doing. Um, as you increase, is this something where effectively as you increase the, uh, the in of the like, um, subspace interpolation, what would this function do? Would it become a better and better approximator or would it, um, or would it continue essentially this, um, this pathological behavior switching back and forth, uh, no matter what? Yeah. So the discontinuity is in, is inherent in yeah. this method. Yeah. And as I said, these numbers, a priori, you don't know which exact number gives the best uh, prediction. So, so, so the best you can do is to do trial and error and see which one gives the most accurate prediction. So there is there is no direction where you can point to to make the interpolation method uh, most accurate. Yeah, that, that's, that, that seems like a key bit where effectively it's not just like, you know, you do some higher order approximation and you can smooth these things out inherent in the algorithm because essentially it's using the closest point. Uh, you are going to be getting these and there's no sort of like a priori, oh, we fiddle with it. You've now created a new step that you would have to take in order to uh, make make to select that parameterization as well. Yeah. So, 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 so this is, as we um mentioned earlier is that the intrinsically you cannot um there is no good way to do model selection for the subspace interpolation method but for gps we can do because i mean Gaussian processes we can use different types of methods for to optimize the hyperparameters and that is a principal way to choose those um uh, hyperparameters for Gaussian process models one other thing about the, this, the image that you have on top of the cylinder, I think this is like a really beautiful representation where I guess, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially you can see it's not just on, if we look at this right tip of the cylinder, what you can see is when you look on the other side, the reflection, um, which I think is a, re a really uh, cool representation. I mean, I know you told us about that going into it, but it is fun seeing it in the actual illustration. Um, yeah. You can see the reflection on the other side and you can see that, uh, that posterior uncertainty essentially being wrapped, like essentially sp spread over a over the surface of the cylinder. I think that's, I don't know. <laughs> there's something just really cool about seeing that representation. Yeah. Well, um, well, this the, the subspace valued function is very difficult to visualize, but this this is the lowest possible dimension, and only this type of problem can be visualized. Um, um, well, but but this is this is a nice and it is helpful to people for people to understand how this problem is different from the traditional real numbered, uh, real valued functions. But I mean, overall, the prediction looks pretty similar if you look in this way, uh, just similar to uh, the previous Gaussian process interpolations using noiseless data set. Well, I hear that David Dunson can both see and think in eight dimensions. So I guess he can just have higher ones, right? Like he, he can just do, do it at once, maybe? Well, maybe. Um, I cannot do that. Um, yeah. so. <laughs> All right. So this is a very simple example and just for illustrative purpose. But we would like also know how it scales to high dimensional problems, which we are actually interested in. So this is how we compare the computational complexity of different methods. So for all, we compare not only the two methods and also two other methods, and we compare um, the computation of two parts. So at the moment, subspace interpolation is the most used method, but the downside is that, as you see, the computation time scales with end, which is very high. So overall, if you have a large end, the prediction, uh, the computation time is going to be really slow. The nice thing about GPS is that we don't have that factor. That makes the GPS faster for uh, large scale problems. We also pro provide two methods, uh, uh, that which are proposed later than subspace inter interpolation. Um, they are proposed exactly to fix the scaling problem. As we see, they also do not scale with n, so they are really fast. But 
they are less accurate, as we will see in our examples later. All right. So the problem, the first problem we will describe is the anemometer, the the flow speed device, which show, which we showed earlier. So, so how the input to this um, problem is the flow, uh, the, the heat source. So. If you see here, this is the center of the device. So this is the device, and at the center, you have a heater, which heats up the fluid. And then on the left and right, you have two sensors to measure the temperature. So the input is how the temperature at the heater changes over time, and the output is the temperature difference at these two sensors, and which is also a function of time. The parameter here is only there is only one parameter, which is the flow speed at the in, at the uh, inlet. We so this is the problem, and we build uh, reduced models for this problem using different methods. And to measure the error uh, of the reduced model, we use two error metrics. One is the L two error. So consider so this is computed as this: you take the original model. Um, which predicts the state as a function of space and time. So, so this is the uh, this special temporal uh, function of the of the temperature, and you take the reduced model, which also provides a prediction in space and time. You sub take the difference and take the overall norm, and that is the L two error. So another metric is called H two error, which instead of looking at the state. You look at the um, output. So the output is a um, is basically a time series, uh, a function in time. You take the prediction by the original model and um, measure the absolute difference um, with the reduced model, and you take the abs uh, the maximum of the absolute error. So this gives you one number, but this um, number corresponds to one specific input. And what we do is we take the overall maximum for all possible inputs and take the max. So, so this is nice uh, in that it is comprehensive. It can considers all possible inputs, but also it is restricted by that we only consider the output, not the full state. So these two are, you can see them as complementary. So next we give uh, the results. So for this problem, we first show the L2 error. So we take the subspace dimension to be 20, uh, and here we use seven points as the sample. Now, for, for this plot, as you see, the y-axis is on the log scale. And the lower the error, the better the method. So here we see that the GPS apparently gives the best, uh, the most accurate predictions. But uh, and next, you see the subspace interpolation. The two other methods are the, word, the least accurate. And um, also, we um, provide a speed up relative, uh, uh, the speed up of the GPS relative to subspace interpolation. So here we have a speed up about 34. Um, so this is one setting. Now we change the subspace dimension to 40 and also increase the sample size to 11. Um, the results on the right is qualitatively similar to the previous setting, and the speed up, relative speed up, is also pretty good. So this is the L2 error. Next, we go to the S2 error for this problem. So we start with also a subspace dimension of 20, and with starting with a higher sample size of 12. And in um, what, what we use differently than the L2 error is that we provide two other reference methods. So here we see the, the reference um, methods, which is use a local basis, or the basis which is um, computed for each parameter value. So these are shown in black curves, and you can consider that as a lower bound. Uh, uh, approximate lower bound. 
And we also use a so-called global basis, which is the fixed basis for the entire parameter space. And that um, gives the, the upper bound. So we want to be as slow as possible. Uh, um, and usually we cannot do better than the local basis. So here for, we see that the GPS method gives predictions almost uh, perfectly matches the, the, the local reference method. And we also see the subspace interpolation method gives a pretty good approximation, but they are less, not as accurate as the GPS method. So the other two methods are not going, doing a bad job as well, but they are still the least accurate. Next, we decrease. Just to say, this is I really like this because I, I wish more uh, ML papers would do this, or they would actually provide like a reasonably hypothesized upper bound and lower bound on performance. Um, you know, because like we're used to it in many statistical areas where we have like a null model of some sort. Um, but there's also ones where you can imagine like, well, we can have predictions under more idealized information or a super idealized uh, model. And I think that th this is cool, like especially forcing people to think about what would actually represent like idealized performance in some way beyond just saying, you know, we'll have the super complex model throughout and see how it performs. But like, well, there's more to something for an idealized uh, representation than just, you know, the modeling. The, there are other bits of information. Anyway, quick side note, but I really appreciate the upper and lower bound on these because I think that's, um, it's informative. And it's also just a really helpful reference. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so here we are using a sample of 12 Next, we actually decrease the sample size and the result looks like this. So the GPS method does not exactly matches the curve anymore, but the nice thing is that for each corresponding parameter value, we have a prediction error matches the level of the um, lower bound, the reference method. In comparison, the, all the other three methods are blowing up in between data points because we have a smaller sample. Um, so, and this is, so they're not doing as good. Next, we are changing, increasing the subspace dimension to 40 and using a sample size of 11. So for this, you, we see that the GPS is also maintaining the, uh, the, the, the error level of the ground truth, but the, all the other three methods are just failing to, to to, to keep the error low. So the takeaway here is that the GPS methods retains the accuracy of the local reduced spaces. Well, um, just a qu quick side note um, before I end the talk. So many people would ask why the ground truths, which is here pictured as the black curves are so weakly, especially if we change the subspace dimension from 20 to 40 or in general, increase the subspace dimension. It, this is because the methods we're using for the local basis. Um, so here we are using a method that minimizes the L2 error, but it does not optimize the H2 error. So here on the H2 error plot, the method um, is doing a pretty good job still, but the this mapping uh, plotted as a function of parameters does not change smoothly in this error metric. But that's, so this is only specific to the method. Um, we also, in our paper, we also provide an example for the micro rocket example. So here we use a different method that locally optimizes the add true error. So the reference curve um, here is again, the black curve. This error curve will be much smoother than what you see earlier. Well. Um, I will not talk uh, in details about this um, method, but again, the takeaway is that the GPS method pr also provides a very good um, approximation to the ground truth uh, the method. Um, well, again, we see that the subspecial interpolation is doing not bad, but less accurate. And the other two methods are just blowing up. They couldn't make a reasonable approximation. So here I will just give a summary for what we discussed today. So the problem, abstract problem we're tackling is to approximate functions that takes values are, that are subspaces. The 
uh, the specific use of this we presented is for parametric reduced order modeling. We have shown that the current best method, which does interpolation on tenor spaces, are uh, have several um, inadequacies and especially slow for large scale systems. And what we presented is to use Gaussian process for this problem. As we said, there were several difficulties in applying GP models. First, the response is very high dimensional, and also it is not a vector space. But we are able to build this method and show that it is both accurate and provides uncertainty quantification. These two features are due to the fact that we are using a Bayesian non-parametric method. Um, and also, perhaps surprisingly, this method is faster than the, uh, the alternative. Well, if you think about it, Gaussian processes are traditionally not known to be fast. I mean, they're, they're accurate, but not fast. But here, for this specific scenario, we are, the GPS method is actually fast for large-scale um, problems. So overall, this method fits the framework of combining a data-driven method, here is the Gaussian process, and physics-based method, which is here the reduced order modeling method. Um, there are several directions we are uh, looking at uh, which can improve in this current method in different directions. And everything we talked about is presented in this paper, which is, current, uh, which is currently being published at the Cyan Journal of Scientific Computing. Um, for, for those who want to take a look into the, the, the program, I also have this uh, R package on my GitHub, and we, uh, I also provide scripts where we can replicate all the examples in the, the paper. And this concludes my talk, and I will be open to questions. Yeah, cool. Can we go back to your uh, future your future work slide? And I guess maybe just quickly plug again um, for anyone who didn't listen to our previous episode. Um, definitely check out uh, Ruda's uh, personal website with all his scientific quotes because he has some really interesting ideas there. Um, that that, that um, he's a uh, a double feature uh, guest where he can talk about some really cool scientific philosophy stuff and also obviously uh, working on some great methods. Um, and I will uh, pop the uh, the links for the paper, Ruder's website, and his academic website in the uh, description. Um, so check for them there. Um, so I did have a few questions about the uh, few direction directions with the priors and the kernels. As you can probably guess, that I was going to work my way back to those. So what what sort of um, uh, what sort of revisions are you thinking about for uh, the kernels, for example? So essentially, uh, for those not familiar with GPs, essentially that describing of the correlational structure between uh, between data points. Yeah, so I so, so for example, there are, there are many ways to you can you can to you can tweak the kernel. Um, for those who are interested, that there is um, you you can read the work how to um, make the, the kernel magic um, by uh, by by like. Um, Duvenal's work. And uh, then you have, for this problem, we specifically, we want to make the computation fast. That's the one of the main goals for the method. But let me go back to the table where we compare the speed up. So the prediction overall um, is dominated by this term, which K, recall that K is the subspace dimension and L is your sample size. And overall, you have the cubic scaling of this method. As we said, it is fast if your problem is uh, really high dimensional, but if you have the situation where, for example, either your subspace cannot be very low dimensional or you have a large sample size, which is often the case if you have a high dimensional parameter space, then you have this trouble of cubic scaling, then the GPS will not be fast um, as you would like to. So one way is to use so-called um, local kernels, or rather um, you can use what is called in the literature as local approximate Gaussian process, LAGP, or um, uh, 
like so, so uh, it's this and there is another uh, approach that can um, make the prediction limited so the basically the, the essential idea is that instead of using the full sample you only use a small sample that is um, localized to your prediction point so that limits the sample size l here and makes the so which will um, cap the computation speed so this is one direction where we can make the to in the kernel to make it um, suit the purpose to be fast is there any risk so uh, just out of curiosity when you reach sort of the edge cases of that locality what are the risks there are we looking at something because you know we saw the risk of what happened when you reach the edge case of uh the, the nearest point in the uh, baseline methods that you described. Um, what, yeah. what, what happens at that sort of the edge edge cases of these um, of these local kernel methods? Yeah, so so those methods are the the, the motivation for those methods is to 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 increase uh, the scalability for for cases where we have a huge number of samples, but um, the trade-off is that you you don't have the prediction as accurate as if you have the full Gaussian process, and um, not only the prediction the accuracy is reduced, the the pre, for example the predictive function becomes unsmooth or discontinuous. Um, so th so this is a um, this is the issue when you use a local kernel, but I mean there is always trade-offs. Life is full of trade-offs. <laughs> There's no free lunch. <laughs> yeah. Cool. And uh, just one final question: When you talk about the priors, uh, var varying the priors, um, what what are you what are you thinking about there? Um. So. So as we go to the if we go to back to the methods, we see that the prior is, well, very simple. So, so as I said, this is the simplest. Prior, I can I can come up with, but potentially you can come up with different priors, and to to make this um uh to but still keep the prediction analytical, and uh so so there can be a lot of work, um not only to the kernel but also to the entire prior. Um, so one thing uh, I, it is very worth mentioning is that currently, um, the method. As we see, we previously used a, a term regression, which we call Gaussian process subspace regression. But in the final version of it, we, we changed it to prediction. So this is based on the fact that if you see the visualization here, at the data points, we are actually still using the data as is. So one concern is that what if your data, um, so here the, the point data points are subspaces. You can what if those reduced subspaces have some uncertainties in there? Then one, so this is one thing where we're currently working on is to turn this point data into a uh, distribution data. And so once you bake in the uncertainty in your subspace response, then the problem turns from a um, like interpolation type of problem to a regression type of problem. So this, for this to work, you need to um, change your prior to 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 uh, to uh, to bake in your um, uh, response uncertainty. So this is yeah, because this is one problem we are currently working on, and I think it's going to be quite useful to also co uh, incorporate the uncertainty in subspaces. Very cool. Rudo, once again, I really enjoyed that, and I can't wait to have you on again in the future. All right, thank you for ha having me.